I spent a lot of time growing up in Tennessee. I graduated from high school there. I went to college at Wesleyan Carson New University. So I have some good southern roots. And uh, while I've been in Florida for a while, I always like coming back here and seeing my friends from the south. Um, let me get the lay of the land a little bit. If I can just see a show of hands, how many of you work at private country clubs now? They're at a private club. How many of you are at public facilities? Okay. How many of you uh, deal with, even if, whether you're at a public or a private facility, answer into a GM or a city manager or a tennis committee? So pretty much everybody. And then the last question is, how many of you actually deal with a budget on a, on a regular basis? And, and are kind of answering to a budget. Okay. So for those of you who are um, working with budgets and have to deal with them and you're held accountable to budgets, I think this will be helpful. For those of you at some point who might work for someone who, where, where you're suddenly thrown into the budget arena where you have to prepare a budget, do a budget, and, uh, and, and really be held accountable to your own budget, I think you're going to find it helpful. I think this is a really important topic, and I think it's an important topic now more than ever because of a couple of things. One is, is tennis directors and tennis professionals and head tennis pros. We're being asked more and more to run a business. And by nature, almost all of us are pretty good at things on the court. We're good at dealing with people. We're good at dealing with issues that come up with our ladies' teams and our, and our men's teams and dealing with parents. That's something that if we couldn't do that really well, we wouldn't be in the room. We wouldn't even be here. Everybody's pretty good at it. One of the things I hear, because I do a, a little bit of uh, traveling, and I'm, not, I'm now I'm not just a USPTA pro, but I'm a CMA member, so I travel around and I go to a lot of the club manager education because I found that to be pretty helpful. But the one, uh, the one undercurrent that I keep hearing from club managers about their tennis directors, and by the way, it's not just us, it's golf directors too, is that while we're very good at people pleasing, we're not always that good at running a business. And when I get back to why I think it's more important now than any other time, I'm going to show you guys something which I happen to get. This is hot off the press. This is the spring issue of Club Management Magazine. Now, can, can you read the title, the cover? Anything but golf. Now, I can promise you that 10 years ago, this would have never been on the cover of the Club Management Magazine. In here, there's an article. Anything but golf. Now, if, if, for those of us that have been in the country club business for a while, it almost gives you goosebumps to think that all of these clubs that are so golf-centric, they're now looking at other ways to attract newer, younger members. And they're looking at ways to keep their clubs viable and to keep their clubs relevant. And it has to be done that's a little less golf-centric. Now, that's where tennis can fill a huge void. Because we already have the infrastructure. We already have programming. We have a good relationship with the national government body. We, we've got a lot of things going on in tennis that we really can translate that will be important to clubs. And not only that, clubs are actually asking for it. I mean, they're looking for great programs. Not just people who can go out and teach tennis well, but people that can run a business and have good business acumen and really understand how to do everything from soup to nuts, how to, how to grow participation, <coughs> how to ultimately get members, and how to get people on the courts. So, we're going to talk a little bit about budgets. Here, here's the, the big dilemma. is Number one, it's not in our strike zone. I don't think anybody got their job as a, as a tennis director or a tennis, uh, head tennis professional because they interviewed, and at some point in the interview, they said, wow, we got to hire Sophie. I mean, she uh, has a master's in accounting. She's exactly who we want to run our tennis program. That's not really in our wheelhouse. Do you have a master's in accounting? I don't feel really <laughs> stupid if you do. Um, but by nature, we're, we're people pleasers. We're not number crunchers. That's what we do. We're out there trying to make people happy. We're trying to make people have a good experience. Um, the, the, and, and that's a little bit of a paradox to <coughs> what the clubs are, because sometimes our facilities tend to be a little bit more bottom line. But we tend to be the people that are people pleasers. Generally, and I, I, I can make this generalization because I've been guilty of it from time to time myself, is that we tend to look at our lesson book first as our barometer for, for success, and we don't really look at how many people are we getting on the courts. And, you know, Craig, Craig you know, nails it when he talks about JTT. 
Well, look, lessons will come if you get people on the court. If we have lots of kids on the court, lots of adults playing, they will, they will eventually come towards our lesson book and we'll generate money from them. I had a, uh, it, it, it's a profit thing. I'm gonna scan through this. I had an incredibly uh, funny video which I'll share with you afterwards. But uh, uh, expectations of the future director. More now than ever, we're expected to do a lot of things and, and <coughs> juggle a lot of balls. We have to manage our staff. We have to, sometimes we're accountable not just for how well we do, but as tennis directors and head pros, we're actually accountable for how well our assistants perform. We have to, we have to run the program. We have to improve member satisfaction. We have to make sure that we always raise the bar and make sure that whether they're our members or our players at our clubs or our facilities, that they always have a good time. And more, more now than ever, I think city managers, if you're at a public place or a public facility, if you're at a private club, they want the tennis person, they want the head of the business to have a vision to understand exactly where are we gonna go? What, what do we wanna do with this tennis operation? What, what is our wheelhouse? What are our, what's our market? Are we a junior oriented club? Are we a senior 3.0 ladies club? We know we need to do a lot of everything, but what's our wheelhouse? What's our vision? And again, I'll come back to that, that phrase. We, we were at the club managers world conference in San Antonio and we had a USPTA booth. And, Tom McGraw jokes about how I walked the wall aisles and didn't really man the booth that much, but I like to work the room. Um, but the one comment people said about their tennis director, not one person came in and said they didn't like the tennis director. Not one person. Everybody came in, yeah, I'm pretty happy with my tennis pro. He or she, great person, really good, really like him. But the one comment that came out from time to time was, we wish they'd be a little bit better in managing the business. We wish they were a little bit better at, at really overseeing and, and running the business. Maybe, you know, handling employees a little differently, better with HR, maybe a little better with the budget, understanding how to, how to let us know what they need and not just take things the way they are. So it, so it all comes back to, it all comes back to how do you do the budget? Because at the end of the day, we're really trying to do two things in most facilities. We're trying to keep people on the court, keep them happy, keep them playing. And then we're trying to do it within the framework of a, of a number that we are going to be held accountable to. So you've got to make your number <coughs> and keep members happy. And if you can do both of those, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to hit a home run. Now, I'll start off and give you a little background because the, the title of this is How to Prepare a, a, a Budget and Get It Passed. Because at some point, we're going to go on the assumption that, that all of you are going to have some input into how your budget is done. We're going to have to, that's probably a question I should have raised in. How many of you have to operate to a budget? I would think most of you. How many of you have no control at all over how that budget is done? Good. Okay. Okay. Couple. Sorry. But you need to get more, a little bit of not control, but a little more input to how the budget's made. It's a little bit unfair to hold someone accountable to a number that they have nothing to do with creating. So if you're in one of those situations where you're, you're being held accountable to a budget and you have nothing to do, then your success is not totally determined by what you do. Your success is determined by the numbers you get. So uh, budgeting myth, uh, you should be making money. Uh, your department is losing <coughs> too much money out here this from time to time. At, at most private clubs, they're in the dues business. The big, large part of the revenue is in their dues. So if you're at a private club, you know, try to keep in mind when you're doing your budget and try to have hopefully a general manager or, or a sports committee person that will help you, that help them to understand that at the end of the day, it's still really about the dues. If you, if you looked at uh, a lot of clubs, by and large, and this is from, from some of the statistics I've seen, probably 60 to 70% of all the club revenue is due. Okay? The two largest money makers after that are usually what? Tell me shop. F and B and, F and, B and golf. Food and beverage and golf are the two, that are the, the two that come right behind it. But dues are gonna be 60 to 70% in most clubs. And you're, you're gonna hear this, uh, golf makes money. Trust me, it's rare that golf actually makes money. 
Golf usually makes money from an operations point of view, but they usually will do a separate line item for something called golf course maintenance, mm -hmm. which is what it costs to actually keep the golf course up. So while golf course looks like it makes money, golf generally generates a lot of revenue. But when you take out the cost of sales of the things in the golf shop, the cost, the cost of operating the golf shop, when you take away some of that, and you actually include the overall cost of golf course maintenance, there are not a lot of private clubs that are making a lot of money in their golf. Food and beverage, forget it. That's it's a whole other losing story because most clubs, they have to have a certain service level. The members don't want to pay a premier price for anything, so food and beverage typically loses money too. So most departments lose money. Uh, and again, I put down there at the bottom, clubs are in the dues business. It all depends on the level of service your club wants to be. So, there are a couple of things that you need to, uh, there are a couple of things that we need, I'm gonna run through this one, uh, that you need to talk about and you need to think about before you even start your budget. Think about the service level of other departments in your area or at your club. Because the mistake that a lot of people make is they sell their tennis department short. If you're in a place that has a wonderful golf course and a great golf experience, and you're in a place that prides itself on nice time. You shouldn't be apologetic about asking for a lot of things for your tennis operation. Um, we, we just, we, we noticed, I noticed that every year at the club championships, the golf would have a gazillion trophies given out. And we did a joint, we started to do a joint awards night with golf. And the first time I did it, I noticed that, geez, you know, golf has, when they give out their awards from their club championships, they give out third flight, low net, third flight, fifth flight, low gross, and there would be tons of awards, and there was this feel good, and I was there running this tennis event where I had, okay, men's day, men's day, and that was it. So now we started doing men's open, women's open, gold, silver, bronze, flights, more flights, more trophies, more people participating, more money, absolutely more money, but, I was kind of, I kind of thought, well, if golf could do it, I could do it too. So look at the, the point is, look at the service level and look at what's being spent around your club and try to make your tennis, and if any of you happen to manage a spa or a, or a fitness operation, uh, maintain it. And answer, answer the question when you're doing your budget, what are the expectations for other departments of the club? And how can I use that, and how can I leverage that to make my department better? There are a couple of questions that I always ask that when, when, when I work on my budget with, with my staff, we try to answer a few questions before we put one number on an Excel spreadsheet. Actually, it's, these are several questions. What type of facility are we trying to be? Are we trying to be McDonald's or are we trying to be Mormons? There's nothing against McDonald's. They make a great product. You know what you're going to get when you go there. Like what is it now, a gazillion served or something like that. But don't compare a, more, a McDonald's to a Morton Steakhouse. The reality is Morton Steakhouse is very upscale. It's a completely different feel when you go in. And then you have a wide range of products in between. So you really need to get your hands around what you want your club to look like. What do you want your facility to look like? What's the standard for your landscape? What's the standard for your courts? Or are you a place where if a if a windscreen happens to tear just a little bit in the side, nobody's going to say anything. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Tom Davis is back there smiling. If you're at the type of place where if a windscreen, the flap of a windscreen being down for 10 minutes is going to get you in trouble, you have to know because that requires more staff. So you have to really understand what type of facility you are. The other thing you need to talk about or at least address is how's your club doing financially? If your club is financially on the uptick, or your, or your city, we see this a lot in South Florida now. You've got a lot of municipalities that have a lot of tax dollars coming in. They're, yes, sir? Tell the entire rap story. Oh, I'll tell that at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Lane likes my tire rap story. <laughs> I'm being filmed, but I'll go over the tire rap story. I worked for a company once that was in the process of, we talk about how's our club doing. Our club was, our, our facility, the company I worked for was going bankrupt. And I knew it was going bankrupt. Having some financial trouble. And the joke used to be the answer to everything was buy more tie wraps. We had a hole in the net, use more tie wraps. Uh, the fences are coming apart, use more tie wraps. Well, I knew it was time to leave when I 
made the call and I found out that we were in credit hole from the time rent. You know, it takes me a while, but I, 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 when I couldn't get any more tie wraps, I knew it was probably time to look for another job. <laughs> Thanks for reminding me of that pitiful point in my life. <laughs> so, know how your club's doing. Um, talking about municipalities, there are a lot of public, uh, public places, municipal tennis centers, that have a huge base of tax dollars. And they're looking for ways to invest in it. And now with golf being a little bit on the downtick, tennis is a great place for them to put their money. So understand what you're dealing with and how people are doing. What's the current financial climate? Or, or, are you in a club that right now is looking at try to spend, trying to spend more money and be better than the next club? Or are you looking at a club that at this point might just be trying to hang on and survive and, and cut? Sometimes the financial climate is determined by what? Change of the board? Certainly by change of the GM. Sometimes the GM's coming in and the mission is to do what? You've got to cut the expenses. We've got to operate the club on a little more of a, uh, <coughs> a financially prudent manner. So probably not the best year to go in and insist that you want to buy a new piece of equipment or a new ball machine or something that you can probably make do for another year. Sometimes the winds are exactly the opposite though. Sometimes you have a new board come in or a new GM come in. They've been brought in under the auspice that, look, nothing's been done to improve the club in a decade. We want improvements. We want to make sure the place is a little bit better. We need to raise the bar. So before you waste your time putting a bunch of numbers down that you think are going to be viable, you, you got to understand what's the, what's the, the <coughs> how your club is doing. And also, have a very open and frank discussion on how many events and how many programs need to be or can be subsidized by your dues. That's a very important question and one that we, we typically don't address enough. You might be at a, at a public facility or a private facility where there's money to actually do events or host events. And if, they are, if, if they're there, try to make sure that you're, you're taking advantage of that and you're putting it out there and you're using that to your advantage. Here we go. Uh, we have what we call the zero-based budget. That basically means that you don't take anything that's been done in the past. You assume that last year was last year and this year is this year and you're going to go ahead and move forward and start looking line by line at everything you have and assign a cost and a revenue to it and try to have a real number. The old days of, of doing your budgets where, and, and I will say this about tennis, because we do not do a large number of revenue at a lot of clubs, what typically happens is you'll have somebody that's a controller, you won't even have the senior family finance guy, you'll have a controller or somebody else, and they're saying, do the tennis budget, it's not that large, add 3% to the revenue, that's basically what it's gonna cost for them to uh, raise the prices on a few things, and uh, go ahead and take most of the expenses and add 3% to it for cost of living, for salary, whatever, and run with it. You, you really can't do that. Don't, don't sell your shelf short. Don't, don't get caught in a pattern where you're following this vicious circle and just doing your budget the same way every time, and I know that's a problem. Don't assume anything, assume nothing. Last year was last year, this year is this year, and decide who you want to be. Because your budget is ultimately going to determine who you're going to be. It's going to determine what type of operation you are and how you, how you run things. It's going to determine the quality of your staff. <coughs> it's, going to determine the, it's going to determine your hours of operation. It's going to determine the quality of merchandise you have in your shop. It's going to determine the quality of your events, the quantity, how many events you have. So before you put a, before you put a number down on a sheet of paper, try to get an idea of all those things and decide who you're going to be. Here, here's some tips when you're doing your budget. And everybody in my staff will, will usually laugh because when it's budget time, I'll throw myself into about one week of lockdown mode. I mean, I, I'm, I'm normally the guy that likes to be out there in the same high every morning. But I will have hours in the day where I'm on lockdown. And it, 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 to me, it's always been that important. The first thing is to involve your staff and your, and your team members and find out their wish list. So how many of you have a staff of three or more people? Okay, good. Probably a good thing to do when you're doing your budget is 
Get your three people in the room, or however many they are, from every department that you oversee, and talk to them candidly. What do we need? You know, they're the eyes and ears. They're seeing things. What's about to break down? What do we have that could be done better? Where have you been where you've seen other things that are nice? I, I've taken it as far to where I've had some of my people actually go to other clubs. You know, I give them a homework assignment. I say, I want you to go to these five clubs. I want you to look around. I want you to come back. I want you to tell me what you saw. And I want you to tell me what, we, what, what they do better than us. It doesn't do any good to sit there on an island and think you're, you've got everything under control. And, you know, I've been amazed because I've come back with it. Now it's really simple because with cell phones and with pictures, you can take videos, you can take pictures of everything. And I've found better, uh, better shoe cleaners. I've found better uh, entrance ways, better awnings. So get together a wish list. Survey your competition. Obviously, you've got to survey for prices. If you're doing a budget, you're budgeting lessons. Might be time to increase your dues. I happen to think that, or your, your uh, lesson rates. I happen to think most pros are way too shy about raising rates because they think it matters to a great many <coughs> members. And I'm not diminishing that. Sometimes it does. But generally, we are way too slow to raise prices on lessons and clinics because we're, you know, it's an uncomfortable thing. We're people pleasers. We're not, we're not generally in the wheelhouse of running the business of saying, you know what? Everybody else is charging that. Everybody else is charging $60. I'm charging 55. I really should charge 60 like everybody else. So survey your competition. Anticipate that prices are going to increase. Uh, if, you, if you run a summer camp, if you run an operation, expect that the cost of your practice balls are going to go up a little bit. Expect that the cost of your junior nets might go up a little bit. So whatever, whenever you have to do that, Make sure you uh, anticipate that the prices of doing business are going to go up, regardless of whether you think they are or not. They always tend to. Lock in prices. Here's a great story. <coughs> I was, uh, we, we did a summer camp, and we would have 50, 40 to 50 kids a day, and we would give them lunch. So I set in a, uh, I made an arrangement at the end of, the summer that next year we would not raise the prices for the lunches for the kids' summer camp. Sound reasonable? We raised them this year. We weren't going to raise them again next year. And uh, we had a new food and beverage director come in who was a great guy, but he was being pounded on his food costs. So guess what happened? Lunches for my kids went from seven to nine dollars. I wasn't really part of the discussion. It was well, chef says he needs it. We're going to let him do it. You seem to be doing okay in your summer camp. You know, eat the two dollars or a hundred dollars now a day for summer camp lunches. So we had to swallow hard and decide if we wanted to raise the price of our summer camp or if we wanted to eat it. So we had a decision that we really didn't want to make. So lock in the prices whenever possible. What I do now going forward, I send a nice email to the beverage department. Say this is what we charge for lunches. This is what you took in in gross revenue for lunches, and next year we would expect that the price should go up two percent or whatever it is so whenever you can lock in a price uh, lock it in um, look for trends look for unusual numbers and, and uh, if you're at a, at a larger club a good process and a good i guess a good practice would be to do a reforecast what, what, what i mean by that is you're, you're usually starting to do next year's budget uh, about the middle of the year you've already gone through. So you've already got six months of, of, uh, of data in the can, so to speak, that you can go off of. But start doing a reforecast and use that reforecast as your budget for next year since you're not going to have an entire year of actuals when you're doing your budget. Does that make sense to everybody? That's a practice that we started doing with the USPTA. Tom's back there. We, we, we would try to do a budget for the following year when we don't really know how we did this year. So we started a new uh, column, Lane saw it, of opportunities, threats, risks, things that might go wrong. So look for things that are unusual. Look for things that, that maybe weren't in the budget and are no, that weren't in the norm. Research and document and tell a story. When you when you're trying to tell the story financially, you're usually doing it to a general manager who is usually pretty good with numbers. They have to report it to a city commissioner or a, or a finance committee. 
who are pretty good with numbers. So have the data and have your details. Uh, monthly reports are for reforecasting, I think, is huge. Uh, if you have a large staff, have a payroll wage and hour report so you see where you're doing versus the budget, and you have that data in front of you. And just remember that history is going to predict uh, history is going to predict the future. I'll show you a little bit just how how granular I try to get when I'm doing my budget. And these are numbers from several years ago. And I'll explain to you why I think it's really important that you do it this way. You know, in the month of January, we we plan that we're going to need a new court rate. So I assign a cost to everything. I list it. I try to put it all into a into a, a, a spreadsheet so that I mean all the way down to you know jokingly there's that tie wraps again. All the way down to tie wraps, court lines, court materials, court <coughs> supplies. I try to get as granular as detail as I can. Because what I don't want is I don't want that that dreaded budget cut coming along in a certain area get get cut because then all of a sudden they'll say, well, you seem to be doing okay, let's get rid of it. And well, you did eliminate my court rate, which we do need to keep the courts up. So the unintended consequences, do you want members coming in to complain to you that the courts aren't as good? Because that's what you're doing when you eliminate $500 and you eliminate my court rate. So you know, try to put, try to put uh, numbers to it. Uh, here's one that I started doing in a lot more detail, and it really helped me when, when you're at a private club. There's a certain amount of events you're going to have that are subsidized. We try to make sure that they're well attended, and they, that these types of events are very well attended. But we try to put an actual number to them so everybody can see exactly what you're going to spend. What we're going to spend. We have a high live event that we have to pay the pros to come to. Um, we have a quarterly water bill that we have to pay. We, we put in gifts for ladies team captains. We put in gifts for everything. We try to make sure that, that again, it, it comes under the dues line, but we want to make sure that everybody understands we're, we're spending this money. The reason the program's going as well as it is because we're spending money doing it. Um, training and education. This is, this is a big one. Uh, how many of you have this, these conferences paid for by the club? or partially paid for by a club. Good. It's good that it's good that a lot of you did. That's a that's a line item that most general managers are very used to seeing. <coughs> there's a line in there for their golf directors, there's a line in there for their accounting people. For most people there's a line in there for golf course maintenance and food and beverage. So we need to get our, our share of that. And at the end of the day it makes it it makes you better at what you do. It, it's also a good practice after you go to a seminar, if it was paid for by your club, send a nice note to whether it's your committee chair or the, whoever you report to, and let them know, thank you for the opportunity to go to Southern Conference. I had a great time. These are some of the seminars I went to. You can feel free to look at them now on YouTube, now that they're on there. Uh, but these are the things I learned. These are the takeaways, which will help me better, help me do a better job and help make the club better. So thank you. So put training and education into your budget. Uh, I, I, again, <coughs> I won't get too granular, or too detailed. But for uh, camp expense, I try to be really transparent. Let everybody know what we're spending on uh, tennis instructors, golf instructors. Our our camp at the summer is a golf and tennis camp. But it comes under the tennis umbrella, and we sub out with the golf pros to do it. Probably because the golf people um, are, are equally busy in the summer, and we take on the liability of having to put 50 kids in the pool and pull them out of the pool. Um, when, you're, when you're budgeting income, again, the devil's in the details. It, it's good to write down and articulate where you're coming, where you're. Uh, what you're doing to get to that number. A lot of times a, a committee or a finance committee person will be looking at that number and you know it doesn't mean anything to them. So when you put down that you're, you're going to do X number of 580 hours of training at an average rate of $65 for the, for the month of January, and that's, a, that's an old one because we're doing a lot more than that now, then they understand that, wow, 580 hours a month, that's how many, that's how many hours they're training. And then they'll go back and think, oh, wow, they probably do need several trainers in order to do that. 
uh, camp income. Again, this falls under the heading of telling the story. And we were going through a period years ago, I'm sure everybody, a lot of people could probably relate to this. We were having a problem where they were talking about not letting us allow outside members, kids, to come to our summer camp. So anyway, going through that bit of brain damage. And we really needed to have outside members to make the, to make the camp viable. So as part of the budgeting process, I just laid it out there and said, you know, that while the camp remains profitable, we question if, it, if after conversion, the committee will want to continue it at its current format of allowing non-members. This will substantially reduce the numbers and make operating summer camp as a profitable entity much less feasible. We're still forecasting another strong year of revenue with slightly less attendance, and that is a typo, that's a long ways away, two, 214. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the overall reputation of items coming more private, profitable or private, thereby close to non residents members. We've added an additional week. I show them the revenue. So when they start talking to me about whether or not they're going to do away with outsiders, we've gotten a lot better now. We actually have a lot of grandkids in the camp. But you can do whatever you want, folks. If you want to eliminate some, if you want to eliminate the outsiders, you're going to eliminate the camp, and you can probably take out eighty-one thousand dollars of revenue. Yes, sir. We don't charge non-member fees whenever you, or? No, we charge the same. same. Yeah, we actually charge the same. Sorry this would be in videotape. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we charge the same. Yeah, Not if anybody sees this on YouTube, no. <laughs> uh, the, the, the reason is, is that for, for us, an outside member generally has, uh, we need to, outside the community, they can go to any camp they want. So we have to deal with being competitive in the pricing. So I suppose we could give our, our, our residents a little bit of a break on it, but it's something that we haven't had to do yet. The, the member complaint members? No, okay. no, we haven't really gotten it because we keep the price of the summer camp down around 250 a, 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 a week. So for the kind of camp they probably want to go to, we haven't used it. Um, I'm going to go over, again, I'll just show you the detail of hours. We put in, a, we're in a little bit of a seasonal club, so some of our positions will be eliminated in the summer. Some of our positions will be cut back in the summer. But I actually learned this and got this chart uh, years ago from Fernando Velasco, who, who's, who's a budgeting whiz. And it's very helpful to drop all of your numbers and drop your hourlies into a big spreadsheet. So that way, if you're overseeing your budget, you can at least control it. And the reason that's important uh, to me is you'd like to have a bottom line that you have to manage to. And there are times that you might have a person on that, uh, on that payroll that you know you might want to let go a little bit earlier to go up north for the summer. You might want to bring them back a little later. That's going to give you some money in <coughs> the bottom line that by the time I took two pros and let them leave a little early for the summer and brought them up a little, brought them back a little bit later in the fall, which they're all too happy to do, I could give my shop manager a two dollar an hour raise, which is a huge difference to him, for him, the case may be. But I like to have that sheet uh, where I have all of my hours and all of my wages in there. So that way I can play with it a little bit myself. So I have to manage to a bottom line, and you'll have to manage to a bottom line. And you'll have that, uh, you'll have the flexibility to do that. You, you, it also helps to put, uh, if you have a large staff, if you have a camp staff, if you have a, in my instance, if you have uh, tennis pros, court maintenance people, uh, retail assistants, I also have fitness trainers, I have, uh, now I have a, a spa organization, so I've got uh, uh, massage therapists that are all employees and managers over there. I, I can sometimes move one from one to the other and have a little flexibility that I can, I can play with a little bit and have some flexibility how I pay people. I try to put all the wages out there. That way at the end of the, at the, end of the budget process, I can look very clearly and see exactly who's, uh, who's making what. Again, that's an older form. Uh, I'm going to blow through this because this tends to get a little granular, but uh, this is a financial report that we have to do. Uh, capital budget. 
Capital budget, a, a really important part of the budgeting process. That, for most clubs, means uh, an investment in a piece of equipment or something that's. <coughs> Some, some clubs have 500, some facilities have 1,000 as a benchmark. But uh, as far as your capital budget, you can get almost anything you want as long as you can pr provide an ROI or return on the investment. Because at that point, it doesn't really cost the club anything. You can, you can get a ball machine. Just, there's, you can lay it out as simple as that. The ball machine's $5,000. If you do an annual ball machine membership and you can sell 40 of them at $100, that's $4,000. You know, it's done. It's a done deal. You can do an RR on a ball machine every year. Then the next year you operate the ball machine at pure profit, and then the following year you operate the ball machine at pure profit, and then the third year, <coughs> no, you're going to buy a new ball machine. So as long as you show the ROI, you can do it. Is anybody? Everybody needs it. Anybody ever had a hypertension? I'll tell my. Okay, we have a spa operation. And I thought that this number was 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 very high. We spent thirty thousand dollars for a machine for a procedure called a hydrofacial. And our spot director made a really compelling, really compelling case for it. And I never thought I'd spend thirty thousand dollars for a piece of machine, but it had an ROI within two years. So it made sense. Again, learn the climate of the facility. We're opening up a new facility. We want to make it better than anybody else. We want to have everything that our rival clubs are having. So with the right ROI, we, we ponied up and bought the machine. But just about anything you have, if you, um, if you can do a return on the investment, chances are pretty good. You'll make a compelling argument that you'll get it. Now, be careful, because if you make a compelling argument to get it, and you've just faked it, you know, if you were a pair of twos there, just totally faking everybody out. Your credibility is on the line. And then the next time you ask, you may probably won't get it. So get the numbers, document anything that's legit. Uh, capital budget. <coughs> it's a good idea to, to look outside of five years. We're, we're now doing it 10. Most clubs do one to five years of capital planning. Have a three, two, one priority list. Again, involve your staff, involve your, your people that are around you, but decide what you need. When do you need to resurface courts? That could fall under capital. When do you need to redo fences, gates, net posts, ball machines, court maintenance vehicles, anything? Go ahead and try not to live in the capital world. Try not to live year to year. That's a mistake a lot of people make. That everything's on everything's on crisis management. Oh crap! This broke and I need to fix it. And I've got to fix it now because you know, I'm not going to wait to redo to, to get a new pool pump or pool heater or or a, a, a ball machine which is broke sometimes or the vehicle that rolls my courts. So have a one to th a five year uh, capital plan and then each year put it. I'm I'm very simplistic. I like to put it on a three two one priority list. One is we, we need it now. One, well, actually, three, three is we want it. It would enhance our facility. It would be nice. Uh, two is we really need it to operate. It would be very hard to operate. And the last one is just it's, we, we physically cannot operate at all if we don't have it done. So a one is going to get done <coughs> because you're not going to close your facility. So, Prioritize what you're what you're putting in uh, what you're putting in there, and if there are things that you want to put in capital, <coughs> attach it or attach a return on the investment with them. That'll that'll probably help. Again, depending on whether or not your uh, your club is on an uptick or a downtick, if you've got an opportunity where they're trying to really enhance the value of the club to the members, that might be a time where you put a few things into your capital request forms or your capital improvements that are going to enhance membership. And you'll be surprised at the things that you know may or may not get get uh, get approved, but put them in. Uh, yes, sir. I don't know if you you do these at your club. I, I know we we started implementing over the last several years. It's called a um, uh, reserve replacement fund, and I don't know if you guys have these. Your members are sent a bill each month, and stuff down in there somewhere. There's going to be a dollar amount that is part of a reserve replacement fund. And this fund goes into a big pot of money in the, within the club that goes to replacing <coughs> equipment, things like that. 
it's it's a way that they can generate funds to do these capital uh, expenditures. Taking it just a little bit further, mine is kind of interesting because we, we just implemented this a few years ago. Um, you know, Chuck just mentioned, you know, repairing things that break. That, that has to happen. But when, for some reason, when it comes to uh, replacing worn out things, the clubs don't do a real good job. And this is where the tennis pros become extremely valuable. I heard Tom Dagman say this earlier this morning in one of his, his um, uh, sessions. Managers hate having to make decisions about things they don't know anything about. And this is one of them. Um, we just did a, a major re overhaul of our, our tennis courts, fences, <coughs> lights. Um, my GM is a great GM, but he wouldn't have had a clue where to start, where to go, who to ask. <coughs> so that's where I came in to do the legwork for him based on not only the, the current leg work, but years of experience doing this work. And that paid back, that paid us back a lot. When I first got there eight years ago, on the replacement fund was a new roller for the tennis courts. Brand new, they were just gonna send it out the door and buy a new one for about $8,000. And so I went in there and I looked at it and I went, what are you gonna do this for? This machine is almost brand new. I mean, and since that day, all I've done to it is put new belts on it, change the oil, I changed one broom on it in eight years, and it runs better than my car. So those are the kind of things that your GM is gonna look to you to advise them on uh, that ultimately saves them money, makes them more financially sound from your department. Um, I'm going through this process buying some new weight equipment. Once again, my general manager doesn't, I mean, he's a great guy, but he wouldn't know a chest press from a treadmill. I mean, so he's going to depend on on the expertise of you guys who are in tennis or tennis and fitness, as, as Chuck and I are. Um, and so, sorry. No, it's all right. Good, good stuff. Good, good points. But most clubs do have some type of capital reserve, uh, and I'm sure city facilities have capital reserve. I guess to, to Lane's point, the, the big point there is get ahead of the discussion. Be a part of the discussion. Don't let don't let somebody else be making financial decisions about your operation when when you can avoid it you can just be ahead of um, I'm going to get us back on track and get us uh, on schedule I hope how much time do we have left okay okay, okay. Well, I want to set I want to set aside some time for questions um, you know to, to, to kind of wrap this up a little bit um, if you're dealing with uh, budget finance people, here are the things to remember. They, they tend to be very data driven. That, that, that is what drives them. So be ahead of it and understand that when you're talking to finance people about numbers, try not to, you know, you, you got to put the smiles in it. You have to put the actual story to it. But you've got to tell, you got to tell the story and understand they're going to, they're going to still come back to the numbers. Uh, generally, they're, they're going to see the numbers first and the people second. You want to look at trends and percentages and try to make sure that you're comparable to other places in your area. If you have a good group of people that are nearby that you can network with and share information internally, that's a that's a good thing to do. They they want to know why they already know the what when it comes to the numbers. We we, when we do our variance reports. We try to make sure we tell a story on everything. Let them know exactly what we're doing. Let, let everybody know all the events you're doing. Let them know that the money that they're spending on their operation is, uh, is, is valuable. And they, they can be convinced of spending money, but they like to see a return on it. The return doesn't always have to be in, in the form of profitable events, but <coughs> keep in mind the bigger picture is always due. So when you do something that, that retains happy members, it's probably worth their investment. And for a lot of people, if they can if, if, if they can run their operation, if you can keep your tennis people, your members happy and satisfied, and keep them very, very content with all their all their coming to their general managers are a positive, fun, great, great reviews, then it's probably worth the investment. So, I set aside some time for questions, if there are. Any. Come on. <laughs> Thank you.
You don't have a little package for this thing. thing? Yeah, right. A uh, little package. I, if, if you um, <laughs> write this down, my, my email is C G I L L at Ivis. B, not Isaac. <laughs> <laughs> I think I brought to you for Next thing you know, I'll come up on a tarot. C Gill at ibisgolf.com. I B I S. I B I S. I B I S. B is in boy. Did the, did the uh, it's it's gonna take a little longer than we thought, but it will. It will. We've got we we had some pricing issues. We've got to get our hands around. Yes, Craig. Um, Sorry if I missed this. Do you have, and this kind of the best practices area, is there anywhere in the USPTA where you have sample budgets and also even potential Excel docs where you can fill in some of this? Because you have great stuff on there, but we don't, but it would be a real good thing to have. And, and I think that your question will kind of spur me to do that. I was going to say, the next one is going to be. Chuck, can you do that? <laughs> can I do this myself? I've gotten, you probably have heard my presentation. I have a lot of help to work. But I can do this. I can do this. It's, Excel is pretty easy to work. Where do we get a hold of those guys? Uh, if you work at a club, there's somebody up oh, here. Your, your club manager probably has it. Oh, okay. he's, he's probably hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would think they'd be coming to you right off, right off the bat wanting to know. Well, my, my, my uh, GM is the head golf pro as well. Okay. Well, that, then they're probably not. They're hiding. They're probably hiding. They're probably hiding. I, guess, I, I struggle with. Correlating the expenses and the income, I have, you know, if I spend a thousand dollars on payroll, I struggle to determine if that payroll is going towards camp, is it going towards maintenance, is it going towards store shop, is it going towards swinging, what's that person actually doing at that time? And I have the same struggles with, I went to Staples, was that because I did some marketing, was that because I did, uh, you know, I bought some office supplies? So in the end, I have all these numbers, and I have a really big, really hard time correlating it. It would take me years to actually correlate it right. How can I keep it simple? Well, you can you can allocate it if you want. And, and that's not an unusual problem. Everybody understand what Sophie was saying? She was talking about how it's hard to allocate staff as far as what they're actually doing and and the and the cost of it. Um, that's a, that's a tough one, but. What some clubs actually do is if they have certain staff that go from department to, to do different things, then it's not uncommon for them to allocate a percentage of the staff, particularly if it's an exempt salary employee. I, I happen to think that muddies it up a little bit. You almost have to just go on the premise that you kind of know what they're doing, but you don't want to get caught mixing it up too much. But that is, that is a dilemma. I don't have an answer to that. <coughs> I just may kind of answer my own question, but I just want to see if you're agreement. Being a public facility, I mean, most of what you were looking at was a pro uh, club setting. Right. But uh, would you say for us, we're looking at numbers of participants that the city wants, instead, you know, they're looking at dues. For us, they want to see numbers and uh, for people playing. I would think they'd absolutely want to see numbers. I think they really would be impressed with, with knowing court statistics, how many people actually play and use the facility, because that's the way they operate with a lot of other things. And they want to know how many kids are on the soccer field. They want to know how many kids are actually participating in all of their youth sports, especially when it comes to a park recreation, from what, what bit I know about it. They want to know participation. So when when you're dealing with a with a contract, particularly with a with a a public park, they're less impressed that your <coughs> program generated you this much profit. They want to know the facilities being used. So you're spot on. Okay? Well, Mike Puck's here, my friend from Florida. Good to see Mike here. No. What are you doing, Gordon? Right here. Right. Okay, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.